episode of Future Construct is supported by Applied Software. We would like to thank them so much for supporting us. Uh, Applied Software is really on a mission to transform industries. They empower their clients and champion innovation with real world expert consultants. So to reach them, you go to asti.com, that's A-S-T-I.com, and please tell them that we at Future Construct and BIM Designs sent you. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Future Construct podcast. I'm your host, Amy Peck. Today, we have Randy Heron, who is the Senior Vice President of Construction Technologies and Manufacturing at TD Industries. Welcome, Randy. Thank you. It's so great to be here. Just an honor. Thanks. So I was reading a bit about your background. So you actually have been with the company for a while now, and you started as a project manager, and you've kind of risen through the ranks. So I'd love to hear a little bit about just, you know, actually even how you got into this industry, uh, but then, you know, a little more about your role at TD Industries. Yeah, absolutely. So it, you know, women in it is Women in Construction Week this week, actually, as well. But um, you know, I come from a, a a family of contractors. My father is a general contractor, and so you know, it's just like when you leave high school at eighteen, you're expected to go find your way in life and know exactly what you want to do. And um, I had a little bit of trouble with that when I first started out. When I went to to college, I went to Texas A and M, and um, wasn't really sure what I wanted to do my freshman year. And so I spent a little bit of time with the different um, departments of the university and colleges, and I found the Department of Construction Science. And so I uh, went and talked to the dean, told them what I was interested in, and they were very, very welcoming. Uh, the, the school was pretty small back then, and I was just one of a few women. Um, but I really liked being in the smaller class environment, uh, the closeness of the school, and so I um, got my degree in that and then I graduated and um, just thought, well, I can, it's just going to be easy to get a job. But I didn't realize that I was a little bit different than the people that most construction companies typically hire. So it took a little bit and um, which I'm glad that it did because, you know, it took a special company um, to, I guess, at what they what some might have thought was taking a bet on me, you know, 25 years ago, uh, a young woman coming into the construction industry, but uh, TD Industries is very, um, is a very progressive company, very diverse company. They value individual differences. It's one of the core values. And so I found a nice soft place to land at TD and started as an assistant project manager and started getting some jobs under my belt. And just kind of from there, you know, project manager, senior project manager. And then eventually I was running what we call our new construction business in Houston. And so that new construction business consisted of all of the pre-construction, the estimators, all of the project management team, the field and um, our draftsmen and women, our BIM designers. And so I, I was over the Houston construction for quite some time. I can't remember exactly how many years. And then I just got to a point where I thought, you know, the future of construction is going to be different than the past has been. And I'm seeing a lot of value in prefabrication and I'm seeing a lot of value in the model, you know, the BIM model and model-led workflows into manufacturing. And so I uh, asked our CEO if I could transition and be over our manufacturing groups and our um, BDC or BIM groups, and then also grew a construction technology team. So very fortunate that um, I've been with such a great company that's really let me grow and, um, is willing to take a bet on my future vision too. I love that story, and I, and I, you know, I love the fact that you that you brought up that it, it you were, you were a little bit different than than right. sort of the normal employee, and I think that that um, is slowly changing. But you know, certainly at the beginning of your career, it was a very different landscape. You know, have you have you had some some challenges? Do you feel like you had to sort of prove yourself, especially with some of the field teams that I'm sure you were interfacing with, uh, especially early in your career? Yeah, you know, I've, I've always found that the field to be a whole lot more embracing than some of the corporate side. You know, I've had some interesting experiences. I've had some 
people that weren't very friendly and very nice, but I kind of always thought and seen those as challenges. Like, what can I do to win them over? Kind of like the obstacle is the way, right? It's like, what, what bias do they have in their life that's causing them to have that reaction? And how can I help teach them something different? How can out of the relationship they have with me, how can they treat other people different in the future? Because now they've got a new normal, right? So, I mean, yeah, there's been some really interesting things along the way, but I think it's helped others grow and it's helped me grow. And um, I think I'm better off for it. Um, you know, not everything in life is gonna be super easy and you just walk in and, and everybody just opens doors for you. And I think that that rough road sometimes makes you even better in the long run. And so I'm just grateful for it. And the construction industry is, you know, despite just the few instances of strange things that I've had to deal with throughout, I'd say it's a very, very welcoming industry. And I'm so in awe and inspired by the young women and women that I see in the industry now. You know, I used to be the only one in the room and I'm no longer the only one in the room. I'm really surrounded and it's such a great feeling. And it's been tremendous over the past few years to really build that network of women that I didn't have early in my career. You know, when, when times change and uh, you can't have your normally scheduled meetings and, you know, everybody's moving to video and you just don't get to see your connections as much. I didn't realize it, but I really missed them. Uh, when we do have the opportunity to get together now, it's it's really nice and just to have that network of women that, that I didn't have early in the career. So it's something that I would encourage young women in the industry to do is find your network, find your group, and um, just to have, um, you know, a group to bounce things off of and help you know that you're on the right path that goes a long way, you know? Yeah, and I think for companies as well, it's it's it is the path forward. It is the way to kind of you know bring in um, more opportunity and to have different perspectives to help sort of you know push technology forward. I mean, there's so much technology coming now, and you know you you saw that a while ago and, and decided to yeah. kind of switch your focus. You know, so so what are some of the ways in which you think technology has improved processes, you know, that, that, that you've actually seen implemented successfully? Yeah, technology, I'm I am so excited. I feel like we're in the renaissance of construction right now as far as technology is concerned. And you know, it's like you can have the best product in the world, but if nobody wants to use it, you know, how good is it and, and what value is it? And so part of the thing that we, we talked about just a minute ago is, you know, change. A lot of change is coming up, right? And change takes brave leaders and create and courageous cultures, right? And so what do we need to do to look at our organization and say, are we courageous enough with our culture? Are we brave enough with our leaders to really embrace this change? because it's, it's transformative, right? So instead of resisting and trying to do things the way we've always done, you know, how can we open up that culture and really embrace this change so that we can fully leverage technology? Because there is, there's a lot coming. Uh, there's a, you know, one of the things that I'm the most excited about right now is really something that uh, we at TD Industries have been working on for the last couple of years within our construction technology and pre-construction teams is establishing a database of all of the parts and pieces that we utilize to fabricate our mechanical and plumbing systems. Um, and so just by having that basis, that database, that single source of truth that we can take from estimating to the model, to fabrication, is, is just tremendous. And for the first time ever, you know, construction is a very, um, I'm gonna say a dirty business, not from the physical work, but from the data perspective. You know, we've never had clean data before. You know, we've, we've estimated a job and we've executed on a job, but making the two match and say, did we really build what we estimated has always been really, really hard. And so having those fundamental building blocks like the database, you know, a transition to Revit uh, across all of our BDC centers of excellence, and then, you know, working with, we've joined forces with Stratus now to manage the workflows from the model into manufacturing. And so just having that infrastructure there so that now we're gonna be able to get data so that people can make 
good decisions moving forward about material types, you know, good, you know, being able to make predictive or have data that's predictive that can help you make the best decisions is, is just so fundamentally amazing right now in construction because we've just struggled and needed it for so long. Um, so it's exciting to finally start to, to walk up this staircase. I would like to thank the team at Applied Software for supporting this episode of the Future Construct podcast. With solutions for really any modern project, Applied Software is on a mission to transform industries by empowering their clients and being the champions of innovation with real world expert consultants. They have a comprehensive array of solutions for AEC, MEP, and manufacturing with a singular focus helping you achieve higher performance. So with software, training, support, consulting, and custom development, Applied Software has you covered for all of your workflow needs. And BIM Designs is proud to be a client and partner of Applied Software. So you can reach them at asti.com, it's asti.com, and please let them know that we here at Future Construct and BIM Designs sent you. You know, you mentioned prefab and, you know, that seems to be taking hold and, uh, you know, more and more. And so what are, again, some of the ways that, you know, companies should be thinking about, you know, leveraging this opportunity to um, kind of, you know, build offsite, you know, build in efficiencies. And, and then what efficiencies is that affording some of the, you know, companies that you're working with? Yeah, absolutely. The construction industry is such a risky business. There's so many unknowns. Uh, your scope isn't always clearly defined. You're making big bets constantly. And so how do you de-risk that? You know, you have um, job sites that can have hundreds of people on them at a time, you know, and, and all of your risk is tied up in the labor on the project. Um, so de-risking is how can you use your labor in a more effective way? How can you move man hours off of the job site and into manufacturing where you have a more controlled environment and you can be more productive? And then, you know, it's, it's, it's not doing more with less, it's doing more effectively, you know, using that talent, that amazing talent that you have in the field you know, to use their intellect to think through the assembly, to think through the design, to think through, you know, how can we make this the most effective, most safe project, you know, and relocate some of those man hours into manufacturing for the pure productivity, the installation, I mean, the assembly and the quality control of your fabricated parts and pieces. And so, you know, the, the previous 15 years of construction is going to be nothing like the few, the next 15 years of construction. Everybody's really saying, this is a risky business. We've been in it for a long time. What can we do to change that to increase certainty and in cost and certainty and schedule? And that comes from prefabrication. So the conversation years ago used to never be that I would have with our general contractor partners would never be about prefabrication. You know, we have always prefabbed. We've had a manufacturing shop for about 40 years. We've always found value in that. But I can say as systems integrator, as a general contractor for the job, they haven't historically been as concerned with that. The conversation has changed now and it's changed because owners want their projects delivered in a different way. They want more certainty in cost and they want more certainty in schedule. You know, so as they're beginning to ask for a different product to be delivered, the general contractors are starting to change their language and really leaning in to those contractors that fabricate, which is really exciting because that's something that we're really good at, right? And so I'm looking forward to really, you know, even going, you know, love our general contractor partners and continue to work with them, but also continue and start to, I'm sorry, work with more of the owner side, you know, especially those serial owners that build all over the world, all over the nation, you know, how can you work with them to productize their buildings, right? Um, a lot of times they're building the same type of facility over and over and over again. Well, how can we engineer and manufacture products like Lego blocks that they can use in each building that we can build, that they can have consistency and quality, and we can ship it to their job site to be assembled. So it's kind of like an awakening and a new way to um, leverage fabrication 
uh, that's not just the traditional delivery methods, but also having those owners get involved, which is really exciting. And to make all of that work, you really need the technology infrastructure, right? It's all about the model. The future is about the BIM model as a, and maximizing what you can get out of it. You know, all of the data, all of our database that we design um, into our, with in our models is what we actually procure. We use, we purchase and go straight into manufacturing. So, you know, it's just that, imp, that technology infrastructure and that backbone is essential for what we're trying to do with manufacturing. So, yeah, and I love that you brought up the data piece because it's something that, you know, not everyone really talks about and how challenging it's mm -hmm. been to actually, you know, kind of match what you set out to build and then get to as built and then kind of, you know, connect, connect the dots. And so with BIM data, you know, I, I certainly see a lot of different opportunities in terms of uh, you know, kind of building management lifecycle, even beyond, uh, w you know, once, once a building is operational. Uh, but how are you, you know, how have you seen BIM sort of change in, in the last, you know, several years? And, and then how do you feel it's going to expand in the future and how we're going to be able to leverage yeah. uh, BIM data? Well, the, the main way that I've seen it change, maybe like over the last 10 years, is that previously it was, we're just going to model this for coordination purposes. You know, we just want to make sure you don't hit each other in the field. Well, now we're all growing up and getting more sophisticated and we're not just coordinating to make sure we don't hit each other. We're coordinating because we're going to actually build this model. We have a, a you know, one of our, our guys on our survey team actually came up with um, a hashtag that we're, we're saying all the time now, but a hashtag build the model. You know, it's, it's not there just just to look at in a BIM coordination meeting. It's there to actually build off of and then be your as-builts as well. So, you know, I'd say that's like the biggest change. And just also the other thing I can think about is just the voice of the BIM designer, right? You know, it was always project team, project manager, superintendent, making a lot of the decisions. I'm seeing that starting to shift to the engineering and expertise of the BIM designer to say, what's the most cost-effective way that we can model this? How can we put this into an assembly? How can we do multi-trade racks? How can we, you know, and just like pushing the limits of the efficiency, the cost efficiency and the, the time in manufacturing and the time of assembly. And those, that BIM designer is making a lot of those decisions now where it used to be the superintendent, right? So uh, it's kind of a, we're, we're all in there still a lot of, it all takes the team. It takes the superintendent and the project manager and the BIM designer, but the BIM designers are a whole lot more involved than they used to be. And, and so looking at the sort of plethora of emerging technology now, AR, VR, you know, blockchain, AI, are you starting to look at that? I mean, it, it's interesting because there's been so much complexity in in the evolution of the construction industry over you know if you even mentioned just over the last decade even mm -hmm. um, but then you have then all this emerging technology that's kind of coming and there are you know pockets of solutions around each of those but i'd love to hear where you think some of this is going and, and some opportunities to bring in these emerging technologies into sort of construction workflows yeah, you know, the emerging technologies that I'm really looking into right now are on the installation side, right? Like on the survey side, what's different out there with robots or different types of technology to actually install the model that's being drawn? So that's where I've been spending some time. Um, and then also, like I talked about earlier, the technology is a model to manufacture. You know, once we get all of that data flow going and we're, we're really successful with our model to manufacture, then how can we look at different technologies within manufacturing to increase the productivity of the way we manufacture? You know, because we're still creating custom systems, not all the time, but you know, those custom systems that we're creating right now, we're saying, how, do, how can we productize and how can we understand that we that we've got certain products that we can put together to make this custom system, right? And so once you start getting into that productization, you really do start to get into more of a pure manufacturing 
mode, which is efficiencies through robotics, which is just really exciting uh, what that can do. And then, you know, also just looking at from the field perspective on, you know, now they've got this great model that's gone through manufacturing and we've built the parts and pieces they need to, to have to assemble on site. You know, what technology can we look at to make it easier for them to lay out in the field? for them to visualize how the product is to be installed. You know, those are different things that we're looking at right now. And have you found um, some, some technology? I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, you, you hit the nail on the head. I think that, that so much is custom and you're, you know, you're building kind of these bespoke systems. Mm -hmm. Are you finding that there are, you know, companies out there that are, that are building more kind of I say off the shelf, there's always some customization, but, but more off the shelf utility or are you seeing that you're just having to, to completely blaze a trail? Yeah, well, it's a little bit of both. There's some amazing companies out there that are that are finding this way, right? Um, but it is, it's blazing that trail. And, you know, I hear Amy Marks with Autodesk speak frequently. She's their head of industrialized construction uh, or evangelist for industrialized construction, I think. And she always says, we need to stop building snowflakes, right? So it's kind of on the industry to say, why do we keep doing this? Why do we keep engineering this customization in? You know, why can't we come together and design some standing building blocks for our standard building blocks for our system, right? And so I think it's going to take a lot of people, you know, at the, with the aid of technology, you know, the, the, the riskiness of construction, right, to say, how do we want to change this industry for the future. And we're, we're starting to see that right now, which is what I love, which is why I said, you know, I've been in this business for over 25 years and I'm going to leave the pure construction side of it and make a switch to the manufacturing and technology side, because I see that vision and that's what I want to be a part of. I want to be a part of the future of construction. Yeah, we, we actually had uh, Amy on the, the podcast uh, yeah. earlier this year and you know, she was, she was very outspoken, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and I think evangelist is the perfect title for her because, mm -hmm. you know, she's not just out there promoting it, but she's saying, look, you know, we, we this is, this is sort of the path forward and this mm -hmm. is building efficiencies that are tremendous for companies. And so right. let's pay attention, let's standardize and let's galvanize. Mm -hmm. And, and so I guess my question to you is, do you find that, as an industry that the competitive advantage, you know, sort of outweighs the notion of, you know, working together even as competitors to propel the industry forward. I mean, how, where do you think the industry sort of lands on the competitive landscape? You know, that is tough because the industry is really competitive. You know, everybody tries to keep their secrets, right? And I think what the future is, isn't as many secrets that I want to keep inside. It's who am I going to partner with that thinks like me that we can scale, right? So, you know, how, especially with the owner direct model, you know, you know, how can I keep this team together? How can I build my, the mechanical and plumbing systems, but maybe can I partner with an electrician to add something to this skid that I'm building or rack that I'm building or, you know, and it's, it's teaming up with different subs and different owners and maybe even different general contractors to produce something that's repeatable. So I'd say, you know, the individual competition on, you know, a new job, the standard way it's out on the street, it's there to bid. Um, I think that competition is still going to stay pretty strong because um, I think there's a lot of amazing construction companies out there that, you know, need to continue to, to um, add to their backlog. But I think that people are going to seek out experts or seek out those future thinkers that are doing things different to say, how can I partner with you so I can produce a product in a different way that we can sell, right? So, you know, in, it sounds like you're sort of, you know, you're part, um, you know, project, you're part technology, visionary, um, but, but then there's the practical component, right? So mm -hmm. you've now envisioned uh, a new way forward, uh, you know, I guess even part R&D, how hard is it within your company to really bring about sort of a new process or a new system? Is that a long life cycle? Um, or are you finding now that, you know, you've started to introduce newer technologies that it's a little bit easier yeah. to sort of push a new process through? Yeah, I, you know, I kind of think about it like design thinking, 
or value proposition, how can, how can with the technology, with the BIM model, with manufacturing, can I solve problems for my internal customers? That would be my construction project teams, right? How can I, what, what is their pain every day? And what are the gains that I could create to erase those pains? You know, and coming from the construction side, I have a lot of that deep empathy built in of 25 years of, of, of living in that pain, you know, so it's, so I can look at things and say, how can I design a product or a solution to help them, right? And I think that once you desi design the pro perfect product for somebody, they let go of those, you know, I don't know about this. I'm not too sure. I got to do it my old way. So it's like, how can I personally solve those for them, right? And so I think when you approach things from just that design thinking perspective, really dig deep with some customer discovery, if you don't already have the empathy to understand what they go through every day, what is it like arriving on a job site super early, freezing cold, working hard all day? What is that like? How could I make that easier for them, right? And so that's just the way I kind of approach it when we look at technology or just a manufacturing product or anything. Well, I think you touch on, uh, you know, going back to sort of women in the industry, I think it's that kind of thinking that sort of, you know, empathetic, uh, sort of looking for understanding, whether it be someone, you know, kind of being adversarial, or whether it's, you know, kind of your, your overall notion that, okay, I'm going to fix some issues. I think having that perspective and being yeah. able to walk in somebody's shoes um, I think is, is, is such an important component of business going forward, but it's something we don't really talk about that much because it can all, you know, it's like, then it touches on emotional and then it touches mm -hmm. on, well, then that's, you know, not a, a business trait that we're after, but I, but I, I, I applaud you for using that and, and using it to your advantage and using it to the best advantage of, of the company, because it's a, it's a, it's a difficult line to walk, to walk, I think. Yeah. And it's, it's, it gets back to your mindset too. You know, it, it, there's an obstacle, you know, I, I feel like I can provide a solution, but that solution might not be, you know, people, people don't like change, right? Like, how do you tip an idea within an organization? And to just really look at it as it's my job to show the value, not their job to figure out the value, right? And so that's just, it's just a mindset. So I'm going to ask you the question that I ask everyone, and it's really about the future and, you know, how we get there. And, and, but this is more personal. It doesn't have to be based in reality. So if you could, you know, project yourself 20, 25 years in the future, and you could just, you know, bring a gadget or just sort of divine, uh, you know, something to bring with you that would just make your life better, make you personally happy what would it be and what would it do? Yeah. Um, you know, as I, my mind is always in the future. I'm always thinking about what's happening next. And so sometimes I fall short on the what's happening right now that need. And so I, I need somebody to take care of me, right? I need a device or a gadget that is like a personal concierge. And I know that we have those already, but I'm like next level personal concierge, right? Like, so I'm vegan, health is really important to me, optimizing what I eat when I eat. That's so complicated. That takes so much time to figure out. I would love something that can monitor the health of my body and tell me what I need to eat and when, because it's just so much work. You know, when you're really thinking about the future and you have this great vision and you're working with tremendous and wonderful people, then you have to take care of yourself and, you know, and it's really, really important. Your health is so important and we're all going to live longer, you know, and we need to live long, healthy lives. Um, and so really taking care of myself and having some assistance with that on like a, a level where it's not just a best practice, but knowing the, the phys physically what my body needs, you know, I think that that's something and beyond just the overall health and taking care and making sure I eat when I'm supposed to eat and what I'm supposed to eat. Just somebody to just handle the details of life because I'd rather work on the relationships that really matter than figuring out when I need to take my cleaning or how to get it picked up or, you know, that that's just all of that life stuff is I think what I would like to have help on. That's, that's really coming. Actually, I'll send you some, some, there's some very interesting, uh, digital therapeutics. There's one that's like a little 
tattoo that monitors your kind of, um, you know, statistics, your bodily vitals. Yes. Love it. If you're, um, you know, dehydrated, exactly what you're talking about when you need to eat. And then I think like an adorable little robot that just kind of does, you know, does right. that, that fixes you the sandwich and brings right. it to you. <laughs> or even something in my glasses when I have to go to the grocery store, you know, well, yeah, I just food, the right shopping base, right? But if I'm looking at a product, they're like, no, don't get that one. There's some bad stuff in it. That would be yeah. fantastic. I love that. Cause yeah, they're trying to, trying to look at ingredients. I think that's great. Yeah, that's a so, lot of work, you know, right? I just Apple, need if you're, if you're listening, when the glasses come out, we need this um, functionality. Yeah. <laughs> well, Randy, it's been an absolute pre- pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you so much sure. for joining us. And are there any sort of final words of advice that you can give uh, uh, our listeners today? Uh, I guess if I sit down and think about advice is, um, you know, be brave and follow your vision, right? Um, people will want to be a part of it, uh, but don't be afraid not to, to try, you know, be courageous and brave. And um, there's a chance that the vision that you have, others will want to follow. Oh, that's great. I love it. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Sure. It was a pleasure. Thank you.